Good evening. Good evening. It's a great time to worship our God. I don't know if I'm live or not. Live? Yeah. Okay. Oh, now I hear. Okay. Uh, so we're so happy to be here and to share God's word with you. And since it's Father's Day, wanted this to be kind of a Father's Day theme. And it turns out that uh, Pastor Kuiper chose the wrong passage because it was the same as mine. <laughs> but I sent mine in first. But both of us changed our minds because we decided, ah, that's too much of a good thing. You wouldn't want to hear the same sermon twice in a row, would you? Even though they're actually probably very different. But anyway, that's one of the exciting things that happened this week. So uh, Sherry Vanderveen is going to lead us in worship by reading Psalm 68, the first 10 verses. So thank you, Sherry. Oh, okay. And you are? <laughs> I'm Mickey. Okay, good. Thank you for leading us in worship. Oh. All right. Well, Sherry was unable to make it tonight, so I will be reading Psalm 68, verses 1 through 10. May God arise. May his enemies be scattered. May his foes flee before him. As smoke is blown away by the wind, may you blow them away as wax melts before the fire. May the wicked perish before God, but may the righteous be glad and rejoice before God. May they be happy and joyful. Sing to God, sing praise to his name. Extol him who rides on the clouds. His name is the Lord and rejoice before him. A father to the fatherless, a defender to the widows is God in his holy dwelling. God sets the lonely in families. He leads forth the prisoners with singing, but the rebellious live in a sun-scorched land. When you went out before your people, O oh God, when you marched through the wasteland, the earth shook, the heavens poured down rain. Before God, the one of Sinai, before God, the God of Israel. You gave abundant showers, O oh God, you refreshed your weary inheritance. Your people settled in it, and from your bounty, O oh God, they, O oh God, you provided for the poor. This is the word of the Lord. You heard how the Lord sets up families, puts fathers and mothers and children together, and so builds community for the church, for the state, for living, and that's why fathers and mothers are so important. And in our country, we're privileged to celebrate a Mother's Day and a Father's Day. And tonight, we open our service with a personal prayer of each one of us asking for God's blessing, following that theme of Father's Day. Our opening song is The Tender Love a Father Has. And of course, all of us fathers here tonight seek to follow the pattern of what our Heavenly Father does. And He does it perfectly. We can't do it perfectly, but we can at least see the pattern and the template He wants for us. And so it starts with The Tender Love a Father Has. Let's sing it together and let's rise to sing.
and God greets us with words that come out of John 15. God the Father, his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us and rose again for our new life, and the Holy Spirit who drew you past the lake and all the boats and brought you right here to church and sitting in the pew together. That Holy Spirit and the Father and Son greet us. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Amen. Wonderful that we're friends of God and that he can greet us. You may be seated. I remember that you always had congregational requests in the evening. And I have a pen, and I have room on the bulletin for some. So, and I remember, sometimes this side would win with most requests, and sometimes this side would win. I never took score, never kept score, but it was kind of interesting to see how that goes. So, who has a prayer request tonight that would like to start? Yes, just to thank you for sending this year. Um, yeah. We have different thoughts on it, so. Okay. We'll have yours expressed. Yes. You know, one of the neatest things about being at Senate this year was the number of youth representatives that were there and just how solidly uh, grounded these kids are in their faith and uh, that they know what is right even in a world that's changing around them. And so that was really neat to see all, all of these kids uh, uh, so strong in their faith. Yes, Sam, who is a daughter of the Venezuelan immigrant pastor, oh, yeah. is a church planter. Yeah. She was really articulate, and you could tell she was doctrinally deep. Yep. She was really rooted and grounded. So she was the only youth person that I heard speak, because I couldn't just sit there and watch Synod. You had the privilege of being exempt from that, because you forced me to come here at night. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway. Uh, I had it on, so I could hear what was going on. But I, I, when she started, I thought, this is a really interesting person. This person is sort of above average. And uh, then I found out that her father is too. Interestingly enough, the Venezuelans, uh, two of their churches joined classes Southern California. And so those, we always think in classes, Minkota, they fly from Michigan or drive from Michigan. But think of flying from Venezuela up to a classes meeting because they so much want to be part of the Christian Reformed Church. And I understand there's 14 more that want to join that classes. So that's exciting. And uh, they are very much like we are in classes, Minn Kota. Really solid, biblically confessional Christians. And uh, that's wonderful to see. Okay, any on this side that maybe I missed? Just praise for the rain that we got. Pardon? Praise for the rain that we got. Oh yeah, praise for the rain. And ask for more. Crops look pretty good traveling from Sioux Falls to here, but you know, you, you all could use more rain, that's for sure. So, any other requests? All right, let's come to God in evening prayer. And uh, one of the things that we should really pray for is that Synod, for two years in a row now, has sent a message 
that the majority of the Christian Reformed Church is biblically confessional, which is what we are in this classes and in this region. And there was always a struggle between those who wanted to go more what we call progressive, uh, become more like a mainline church rather than a solidly committed reformed church. So we're thankful that Synod sent that message two years in a row, and I think that that's probably going to be the way it continues to, to go, like next year again. So it'll be three years in a row, because once the officers who appoint the committees come with that kind of conservative view, then they appoint the committees so that they can perpetuate that. So we'll just see how God leads. But so far, we, we can be very thankful for that. So we're going to thank God for that as well, because we love the CRC and we want to see it grow and develop and prosper and become vigorous and, uh, vigorous and vibrant again. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for you. We're so thankful that we can begin our prayers, our Father, who art in heaven. And we who are fathers here tonight know how difficult it can be to imitate you. Yet, thanks to your Holy Spirit, we are able to begin to see that some of the same characteristics that you have in caring for us, we must have in caring for our families. And it's our joy to see from the Bible just how that can happen. We're thankful, Father in heaven, for the rich message of salvation that you've given. Placing mothers and fathers in homes where children are born and children are adopted into those families. And we see people thriving in their faith. We thank you for the sacrament of baptism that seals them as your children. For profession of faith in which we hear those strong words of courage and conviction and for the Lord's Supper where we sit down and sacramentally share in the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And these steps, we thank you, are guide, guided and guarded by fathers who are faithful and fathers of faith. And we pray for such to be in our congregation, in our community, in our country, and around the world. We also thank you, Father in heaven, for the privilege that we have to worship you together tonight. We're thankful, too, that we see among the young people a real commitment to you, that the next generation will be more solid and more committed to the scriptures and to biblical theology than have the generation just passed. And we're thankful that we see it in the candidates we examine at classes. We see it in young people who are advisors at Synod. We see it in our opportunities for youth to serve and do so throughout the summer months. In so many ways, we see that you're building your church and you're providing spiritual strength for the next generation. And while we know that the days of trial are coming, uh, so much so that just before Jesus returns, even the elect would not endure if Christ did not shorten the days that you're creating strong young people who can stand at the times of temptation, can give a cure of the Bible to our culture, 
and can build on our faith. And Lord, we've prayed for a lot of spiritual things tonight. But you know, practically, no rain, no crops, no crops, no food. And we pray for daily bread. And behind that prayer is a prayer for adequate rain and sunshine to give us an abundant harvest. And we pray that every farm represented here tonight will by the end of this season be able to say, God is good. He sent us what we needed. And so we not only have the living bread of the Lord Jesus Christ and the living water that Jesus offers, but God has we watered our fields and given us the sunshine we needed so that we can have bread on our table and we can once again, as we pray the Lord's Prayer together, say that indeed God has provided our daily bread. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for listening to our evening prayer. Bless your word as we open it together. And may we find strength spiritually in your word and in the confessions of our church. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we open God's word, we're going to rise and sing, In Our Household's Heavenly Father. I gathered you didn't know that first song very well. Uh, you know, it's hard to know when you're a visiting pastor, what that congregation knows or doesn't know. Uh, I hope that maybe you know in our household, Heavenly Father, a little more. Do you know that one more? Or are we going to struggle again? <laughs> Pardon? They don't know it very well. Let's see, what's the last song we're going to sing? Parents tell your children, do they know that? Oh, they know that. Okay. We'll look forward to that at the end of the message. <laughs> so, okay, let's rise to sing, and we'll do the best we can. In Ephesians, there's, a six, there's four verses here in the sixth chapter that I think are really special. Now, I was told by our young people that there's not so many young people here. That is too bad. But the truth is, the Bible specifically focuses on children. And we have that, for example, in the Ten Commandments. Children. Now here, in Ephesians 6, we're going to read the first four verses. It starts, children, 
Obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. That challenge on Father's Day is great for us. And so we really want to think about that. Now, the title of tonight's message is called Held by God the Father. And held by God is one way that we talk in contemporary theology about perseverance of the saints. And I think what I'm going to have here is the first slide. Here it goes. Oops, I went too far. We always thought of TULIP, total, total depravity, unconditional election, limited home, irresistible grace, perseverance of the saints. That means we keep moving forward in our faith. But a newer way that we talk about it, and especially when you talk about it with other groups that are not reformed, other Christian groups, we talk about faith, that we are fallen humanity, we're adopted by God, there's intentional atonement, transformed by the Holy Spirit, but now the frosting on the cake is held by God. When you were a child and you fell, and you're bleeding from your elbow and your knees. What did you want to do? You wanted to get to the house as fast as you could so that your father and your mother could hold you. And when you and I fail as Christians and we're spiritually bleeding, God comes and he says, I want to hold you. And I want to take your hand. And I want to walk with you so that you don't stumble again, but that you really live with me and for me and through me with your power and strength. And so when we think about it, what would a father do with an injured child? Hug that child. Maybe put a Band-Aid on after they've settled down a little bit. But the first thing you have to do is take care of those tears. And you only take care of them by hugging and holding that child. And that's what God does with you and me. He comes to hold us and help us and hug us. Now, if we were reading Peter, this is what he says. Which way? Aim, aim, oh, I got to aim, aim it that, that way. way and then we'll go on there. Yep. Boy, <laughs> go to the gym, huh? So, P, this first Peter one starts. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect. Well, we are God's elect. And it starts, of course, with baptism. I mean, now you've got your baptismal font up here and your communion table over mm -hmm. here. Well, yeah, that's where it starts, is when we are conceived, we are God's child, and God embraces us. Now, God sort of certifies that at the time of baptism, and so when we have a child up here and the child is baptized, and God speaks, we know that the, we see the parents. We see maybe the mom holding the child and the father holding one of the younger children up so they can see the water. And then, of course, we look forward to the time when that child stands up here and makes profession of faith so that they can share in the supper of the Lord Jesus Christ. Though that's really important for us. That's our walk with God. That's what it is to be elect. That from our very conception, we belong to God. But what is God going to do 
to keep us from falling into Satan's traps. And what is God going to do to lead us by the hand and hold us when we sin? And so I'm going to share with you some of the rest of that chapter, which actually comes from the message. What a God we have, and how fortunate we are to have him, this father of our master Jesus. Because Jesus was raised from the dead, we've been given a brand new life and have everything to live for, including a future in heaven. And the future starts now. God is keeping careful watch over us and the future. The day is coming when you'll have it all, life healed and whole. Whoops. I know how, whoops, sorry about that. I know how great this makes you feel, even though you have put up with every kind of aggravation in the meantime. Pure gold put in the fire comes out of it proved pure. Genuine faith put through suffering comes out proved genuine. When Jesus wraps this all up, it's your faith, not your gold, that God will have on display as evidence of his victory. So those are verses 3 through 7 of 1 Peter 1. Isn't that great? That even in our sufferings, God is refining us and making us like pure spiritual gold. And that's God's goal for us. Because from the time of conception until the time we die and go into the heavenly kingdom, God is there as our Father, holding us, helping us walk with him. And how important that is for us to do. Now, sometimes we talk about, oh, Peter talk, goes on. He develops that whole idea. And Peter, in a later chapter, puts it this way. That's too far. But you're a, this is what happens to you and to me. You are a chosen people. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And the mercy is that Jesus came on Calvary's cross. And after living a perfect life for about 33 years, he died on that cross, became the sacrifice for us. And then, of course, he rose again on resurrection morning. And we're all reminded of that powerful moment when the gravestone rolled away and the angels sat on it and Jesus powerfully was a risen Savior and Lord. And that Jesus enables you to stand before the Father and the Father wants to hold you and help you. Now, we have this whole teaching that we call perseverance of the saints. That perseverance of the saints is how we move from a beginning spiritual life to a richer, more developed spiritual life. And what God does in developing that is gives us a new heart. And he puts a new spirit in us. I will remove from your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Now that process of what God does described here in Ezekiel 36, that's eh, kind of a long verse to memorize, right? And so 
we've come up with this kind of short way of speaking about it when we say perseverance, steadfast pursuit of an undertaking or aim, says Webster. But then Webster's dictionary gives this theological definition. Perseverance is continuance in a state of grace until it is succeeded by a state of glory. That is, you keep living because God is holding on to you. God is leading you by the hand. And that perseverance means you're going to finally die and go into the next state. Now, the problem with perseverance of the saints is that it sounds like what a Christian does. But in reality, we Christians are held by the hands of God. It's not what I do, not what you do. It's not even your pastor going to synod and voting wisely. It is God coming and saying, my child, your knees bleed and your elbow hurts and you skinned yourself. And I'm here to hug you, to hold you, and say, I love you. You're my child. You've been that since conception. I was there at your baptism. And while it looked like mom and dad were the principal people, I was there. And I was more the principal person there than they, because I was taking you as a child and hugging you and holding you. And that was the certification of it, that written statement of being baptized. And so since it's really God who does it, we really should think in different terms than perseverance of the saints as though we were doing all the work, when in reality, God is doing all the work. And that's one of the reasons why when we speak to Christians of other branches of Christianity, we want to phrase it, not in terms of perseverance of the saints, but in how God cares for us in his sovereignty and in his grace, making us people who want to emphasize the sovereignty of God and the graciousness of God. We see that in a whole variety of verses in the Bible. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. And what does Jesus say? If the thief is taking care of the, uh, the sheep, or even a substitute shepherd is caring for the sheep, the thief can steal it or the coyotes can come and take the sheep and kill them. But I'm your shepherd. I love you. I care about you. I'm here for you. Held by God. Psalm 73, 23, yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand held by God. And you'll notice the emphasis in these Bible verses about the right hand. Now, I know some of you are left-handed, but most of us are right-handed. And it's with the right hand that we have strength. And God talks, too, about the strength that he has with his right hand. And what does God say about his right hand in the Bible? In Isaiah, he says, when I go out to do my work every day, my providential care of the universe, what do I see? I see your names engraved on the palms of my hands. I read Jack Gray. I read whatever your name might be tonight. 
because when I stretch out my hands in love and care, your name is on the palm of my hand, held by God. Psalm 139, 10, even though your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. Oh, it's so easy to slip on the ice of sin. But God is there to hold us up. We are held by our God. And then we have Isaiah 41, 13. For I am the Lord your God, who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear, I will help you. What a tremendous comfort that is. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. But this I know, because the Bible tells me, God says, do not fear. I will help you, held by God. John 10, 11, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Yes, we're held by God who loves us dearly and deeply. We do not hold on to God. God holds on to us. And for all of you here tonight, I think you can figure out the difference. Because let's just say the left hand here for me is me, and the right hand here is God. Now, if I'm holding on to God, I might get tired tonight. I might fall asleep. I might let go of God. But if God holds on to me, he never slumbers nor sleeps. And he's going to hold on to me with a grip of his right hand, with my name written on it, and yours. And you're going to be held secure. One of the great novels that came out of the Russian Revolution was Boris Pasternak's great novel, Dr. Shivago. Now, those of you who remember Dr. Shivago a little bit or maybe remember seeing the movie, it's all about who held whose hand. Because this young girl, college age about, she said, there was this terrific explosion. And when it happened, the person who was holding my hand let go. And I was scared out of my wits. And then the novel goes to prove that the person who was holding her hand was actually the one who was sort of guarding her on behalf of the family. Dr. Shivago, you know, was busy like all the doctors are today, doing surgeries, consulting with people and whatnot. He was gone. So he had somebody taking care of her. And he was the person who let go of her hand. It was he who disappeared and was blown up in the explosion. And it keeps flipping back again and again and again that the character of Dr. Shivago was such that he would have held her hand because a father always holds his child's hand. A father always cares for his child, holding on to them with his heart strings and his words of comfort and encouragement, stretching out a hand in the pattern of our Heavenly Father. 
It's our privilege as fathers here tonight to be acting and living in the pattern that our Heavenly Father gave us, a pattern in which we hang on to our children with our right hand and our children are the left hand. We have a pattern in which we are held on to by God with his right hand on our left hand. And so that heavenly pattern is a wonderful boost to our spiritual life. In fact, it is our life because without God hanging on to us, we simply cannot live as Christians. Now you say, don't all Christians believe that? No, they don't. There's a lot of branches of Christianity uh, that follow what we call Arminianism. That was named for Arminius, a guy in the Middle Ages, and before that, actually. And he said, what you do is important for you. I don't know if you remember when Toyota unleashed the Lexus on America. And then what was their line that they had introducing this luxury line of their cars? It was a fancy Toyota, just put a lot on it, charge a lot bigger price, and tell people what? It was made with a passionate pursuit of perfection. Remember those commercials? The passionate pursuit of perfection. I like that. Because that's pure Arminianism. Where we really work hard and we persevere as saints and so we're ready to go to heaven when we die. The passionate pursuit of perfection. My grandmother was a member of one of those kinds of churches. It was a church in which it was so important to attend every service, to go through certain rituals in preparing for the service. It was so important. And if you were imperfect in some of those areas, you didn't even dare take the Lord's Supper. The congregation of which she was a part was several hundred people, actually closer to a thousand than a hundred. But about five people would take the Lord's Supper. And what did the rest of the congregation say? Yeah, they think they've survived in this passionate pursuit of perfection. And what makes them think that they're so holy they can take communion? And so you had this kind of really strange thing, everybody trying to persevere. Then when my grandmother got older, she got Alzheimer's. And you know, when you're in Alzheimer's, you're really not very much yourself anymore. And so you do some things that are out of character. And she died. I was not at her funeral. But this is what I was told about her funeral. Is the pastor made it really plain that she was burning in hell. Because first, she made herself pious above the rest, one who always went to communion when you knew nobody's perfect. And second, she let go of any vestige she had of God when the Alzheimer's came. And so you know from the things that happened at the end of her life that there was no way she was clinging to God anymore. What a message. But that's what you have when you're an Arminian, believing that you are in charge and that your faith is doing it. 
when in reality, God is coming and holding us and helping us and leading us all the way. Really, that's why we have the most commonly used confession in the world today. It's the Heidelberg Catechism. And how does it begin? What's your only comfort in life and in death? My only comfort in life and in death is let's say it together, is not that I'm not my own, but belong in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. We belong because God's holding us. We belong in his family. We discipline our children. We delight in our children. Our children are in our family. And you and I are in God's family because he delights in us and he disciplines us and he cares for us graphically and powerfully. You've been looking at R.C. Sproul there, Coram Deo. That's Latin for living before the face of God. And that's what we do. We live before God Almighty. We live before him humbly, sincerely, and most of all, very deeply devoted to him. And then we have those powerful verses that come to us at the close of the book of Romans 8. Held by God. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Father in heaven, thank you for giving us Father's Day here in the United States of America where we fathers can reflect on how we're following you, holding our children when they fall, providing them comfort, assurance, when they fall spiritually, coming alongside of them with grace and punishment and pardon. Lord, purify our lives, not by what we do, but what Jesus has done for us on the cross. And make us your children whether we're mothers or fathers or none yet of those things. Father, just embrace us and love us and lavish your grace on us and help every father here in the Worthington Christian Reformed Church to do exactly the same and pattering his life after you. Oh, Lord God, forgive us for our failures. Forge in us a new faith and make us powerful followers of you and the culture in which we live so that the voices we have speak with power and conviction and courage to our culture. Make us men who are godly, men who care about our families, 
men who make a commitment to you in church by service. And help us, Father in heaven, to be men who stand strong in our culture against all the curriculums and all the characters of our current age. We need you. So hold us tight in your hands. And Father in heaven, what we really need and what we really need tonight is that we can tell our children how much we desire to be like our Father in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. And Holy Spirit, with groanings we can't utter, take our prayer to the Father. Amen. We're going to rise and sing, Parents, Tell Your Children, and then we're going to have a confessional review here of the Canons of Dort, the fifth point of doctrine, Article 8. It's going to kind of reflect what we've been talking about in the message tonight. And then we'll conclude with 2 Thessalonians 2, 16, 17 as our benediction and our glory, uh, doxology, glory be to the Father. So let's rise to sing the song we know, Tell Parents, Tell Your Children. It's just called Tell Your Children. But uh, let's rise to sing together. have our doctrinal confessional on a slide okay then we have to tear to the hymnal let's see if we can find it fast canons of dort and notice there's only one end that means teachings not a boom can kind of canons here we need the fifth main point of doctrine 944. 
page 944. And it's in the first column. It's eight. And do we read this together or do I just read it? Your so, call. What? Your call. My call. Let's read it together. So it is not by their own merits or strength, but by God's undeserved mercy, that they neither forfeit faith and grace totally, nor remain in their downfalls to the end in our loss. With respect to themselves, this is not only to truly have it happen, but also undoubtedly would happen. But with respect to God, it cannot possibly happen. Since his plan cannot be changed, his promise cannot fail. The calling according to his purpose cannot be revoked. The merit of Christ, as well as his intercedence and perseverance, cannot be nullified. And the sealing of the Holy Spirit can neither be invalidated nor wiped out. That's God's powerful way of speaking to us. Our forefathers spoke it, and we have also addressed it tonight. And this is God's blessing to us that comes out of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Amen.